encountered. But military interventions, and I think Afghanistan have shown us that clearly are futile. The interventions that we've seen in Iraq, the interventions that we've seen uh, uh, in Afghanistan, they just wasted a lot of resources and um, opened a Pandora box that really reflected badly on these very societies. But at the same time, they did not really address the issue. And the issue is that you have the ideological foundation of this jihadism, of this violence. And that ideological foundation is called Islamism, a political ideology but the political ideology is based on a religious interpretation. And without saying it and articulating the problem, we will be basically moving in circles and not crossing the boundaries of these circles. And um, yes, um, on the one hand, when it comes to this violence, to this terrorism caused uh, by Islamism, there is a very important component that has to do with this new fundamentalist uh, ideology. And that means we have to look what kind of Islam we are, be, we are teaching children under the leadership of Islamist organization. That's one component. And the general question, does Islam need reformation? Yes, Islam does need reformation because until today we are unable um, to look at our um, holy text and acknowledge the human nature uh, in it. And without addressing this specific point, without separating ourselves from, or without the ability of looking at these texts, these holy texts within their historical um, context, we will keep asking the same questions again and again and again. And let me just tell you something, because I don't want the listener or the, uh, the, the, the viewer to come out of this session feeling uh, um, pessimistic. Um, after the uprisings uh, of 2010, 2011, um, in the Middle East. Today, everybody will tell you the Arab Spring, that was a catastrophe, politically maybe, but look at the consequences on a social and intellectual level and you see something is changing. Something is really changing. And the discussion that are taking place, the forums, the online um, publications, the ability to access information, has been important. I'll put it this way, all of this give space for optimism. Last week on Saturday, I was invited to an online discussion by a Yemeni professional forum. We were three speakers, all speaking in Arabic, and we were talking about future, freedom, and thinking. Our session here, it's, uh, it has the, the, the title permission to think, and we were permitted to think there. And I, in my talk, in Arabic, I talked about the importance of breaking these boundaries of thinking and acknowledging the human nature of Quran, of Quran, our holy book, and making sure that we basically... Uh, reach a conclusion um, that we can separate ourselves also um, from certain perceptions and laws um, in uh, our holy uh, books. So what I'm trying to say is basically, even while I'm talking to you right now, I'm talking in English and Arabic, I'm saying similar um, mm. I'm saying the same. Well, I'm, I'm glad um, Alan, that, you, that you emphasize that you're saying the same thing in English and Arabic, because you also talk about it, it in your writing. And we can we can we can end with this because I think you can take it wherever you, you want. But you talk about how after the Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre in France, 
uh, the Saudis, uh, the Saudi government said this is terrible. We don't, we oppose all of this. There is freedom of thought and freedom of speech. We, they, they did all of the necessary genuflection towards liberal ideals that you might expect them to. Came to France, the crown prince or whoever it was, and paid respects and marched with the French president. And in that very same week, you make the point that there was a, a blogger, probably more than one, a, a free thinker in Saudi Arabia who was being publicly flogged in the town mm. square for, a, right, for really. having the wrong beliefs to, about, about Islam. So is it possible to move to another stage of Islamic enlightenment or reformation without doing away with those power structures at the top in yeah. Saudi Arabia and similar countries? And if so, or if not, what could we in the West <laughs> be doing to do better? No, um, I'll tell you something is uh, uh, that was 2015, um, move forward, so 2021, and you see things are changing also in the very country that you mentioned, Saudi Arabia. You see um, a movement away from this reactionary interpretation uh, of Islam. Now, the question for me, uh, moving away, uh, because you see a form, the development in Saudi Arabia right now, um, has taken a shape where the suffocating social religious control that was imposed uh, by the regime uh, of this very religious fundamentalist uh, interpretation uh, ceased, ceased. Um, the things that were imposed, segregation between the sexes, uh, imposition of uh, either uh, niqab or uh, burqa or uh, headscarf, that ends. Um, more uh, liberal freedoms is taken, um, is being given. Now, for me, the key issue is when Saudi Arabia, through its Salafi arm, that is the word Muslim leak, when it propagate this new line religiously. So the problem is this word Muslim leak build mosques, provide the books, provide the training for the imams. And that happens in Australia, that happens in other uh, Western democratic uh, countries. For me, in order for these changes to be really authentic, sustainable, and believable, I need to see the books that are being taught to the children. Are you still promoting the writing of the Wahhabi uh, founders and Specifically, um, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he has a very famous book, Tawheed. Are you promoting the writings of the Salafi Saudi leaders, religious leaders? If you're doing that, then you're contradicting your own policies. Right, anyway. but they're Salafists. Of course, they're going to be using those books. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. And that means... As on the one hand, I'd like in country, in Western democratic countries, to make laws that stop the flood, the financial um, um, resources that are flooding these organizations or mosques. Stop it. Make a stop to it. And then afterwards, when it comes to, because as a Muslim, this is like, now I'm Swiss of Arab origin, but Islam is my religion. It's my faith. I would like to go to a mosque where I could even trust the imam or the religious classes they provide to teach my, my daughter. Um, I refrain from doing that because I don't have that trust. Mm. Okay. So in so order would you, would you to create an would you create an independent funding source for Muslim theology in Western countries to cut them that's, off from Saudi Arabia? That's what I'm, what, that's what I'm actually um, um, demanding, is that we need to develop at the universities certain kind of colleagues, uh, theology colleagues, that brings the best of this tradition and train imams and create religious teaching uh, curriculums for children. We need the states um, in Western democracies to make sure that this is being done in a manner that 
um, is not subject to abuse by fundamentalism or Islamists. And, uh, and that, that is yet to be uh, done in a manner that you could say, this country is implementing this um, model and we could uh, follow suit. This is important. We need policy measures that make sure that the religious teaching the imams are being trained and taught in a manner that provide a religious, that covers the religious demands uh, of those who would like to believe, but in a manner that stops this influence from the outside and changes the nature of people. Good luck with that project, Elham. <laughs> thank you <laughs> for articulating it so eloquently and thank you for joining us. It's lovely to meet you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Josh.